thank you for everything you do. I know you're taking care of the whole country. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I would just praise you tonight. Lord, speak through Barbara. Open our ears, Heavenly Father. Lord, touch our hearts. Lord, thank you for this day, God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. God, you're so good. Amen. Okay, um, tonight we're going to be uh, continue looking at the letters that were written by the uh, Apostle Paul. And so it's going to be part two of last week's lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at how Jesus is the head of the church. And this lesson is going to advance the previous lesson on the reconciling work of Jesus, um, the encouragement of unity within the church, and a commitment to the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. That's what we looked at last week. Now, Paul's focus in this lesson lesson is how Jesus is the head of the church. We're going to talk about Jesus' soon return, and we're going to talk about leadership in the church. And the range of topics covered in these letters, as well as their timelessness, reminds us, and we all know this, that Paul was inspired by God as he wrote these words. And his message, like I said, they're timeless and they're true, and um, they're relevant today, just just as they were back then. Now, the original recipients of the Paul's letters, they were still learning about the benefits of having a relationship with God. And those um, back then, those Christians, uh, they'd been a Christians for many years. Um, so they heard these truths before, but they were new to the first century audiences. And so, um, hopefully, I'm going to do a PowerPoint. Let's hope this comes out now. Um, we're going to be looking at how, as the PowerPoint says, Christ in his church and how uh, um, Christ is the head of the church. And we all, as I just said, Christ is the head of the church. And so, I want you to think about for a minute, what does our head, <laughs> what does our head, our noggin, do for the body well it chooses the direction and the actions of the body okay it's going to direct the members which are our feet our hands our toes and all of that the members of our body to care for our body okay i'm going to give you an example what i mean for example if our finger touches a hot stove the head is going to tell our hands and our wrists and our elbows. It's going to say, hey, guys, move away from that hot stove. Get away from that heat. Well, Jesus, he also used members of the body to care for one another. In the Apostle Paul, he used uh, multiple metaphors when he was talking about the church. Okay? And... And it refers, when he talks about the church, it's going to refer to all believers that are around the world. Now, one of Paul's most meaningful and insightful metaphors is the comparison between the church and the human body. And if you want to learn about that, you want to see where it's found, you can find it in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27. And that gives you more details about, about that, um, that topic. Now, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And that's going to offer deeper, it's going to be deeper insights into this concept. And and in these passages, Paul taught that Jesus, like I said, he's the head of the body or the church. And this metaphor, it, it emphasizes Jesus, his supremacy, his leadership, and his sustenance for the, the community that believes in him. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 20, it establishes this reality on the fact that Jesus is the divine 
creator. Now, I'm going to be reading again in um, the NIV version, and in some of these um, scriptures tonight, there's going to be different um, versions of the Bible, and I'll tell you as I use, as I do. So Colossians chapter 1, verse it. Uh, yeah, Colossians chapter one, verses fifteen to twenty. The Son is the invisible is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have this supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So I want to point out some of Paul's exalted language in this Colossian passage, okay? And it says that Jesus is, what does scripture say? It says that he is the son of God. It says, scripture says that he is the very image of God, who is, scripture says, invisible. The one in him, all the fullness of God dwells. Now, Jesus himself, he declared this truth when he told the apostles that anyone who has seen him has seen the father you could find that in john chapter 14 verse 9. now jesus he's not merely a replica of the father he's not merely a a representative of the father he's all and we know this he's all that the father is and to declare that he was is verse 15 says the first born over uh, creation all creation it doesn't just recognize that jesus is eternal it also sees jesus as he's preeminent over creation jesus was and is both the creator and the sustainer of all things and he's also the way by which sinful humanity is reconciled to the father and we know that how did he do that well he died on the cross and then he rose from the dead now paul also used a different metaphor in emphasizing the importance of jesus in understanding the church and that's going to be in ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 all the way down to, excuse me, 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus, Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built to come become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So in this passage, Paul is expressing the relationship by those uh, Jews and Gentiles who believe um, and and they find themselves united in God in three figures of speech. Let's look at them. First of all, they're citizens of a commonwealth. Then they're members of a household and then they're stones in a temple. Now, in these three metaphors, there's three fundamental human relationships that are suggested. And to the state, it's as a subject. To the family, as a child, and to God as a worshiper. In verse 19, when it says foreigners and aliens, the King James Version says strangers and foreigners. Those are residents and they had restricted rights, okay? And so when Paul used uh, this concept, when he related that concept to the Ephesians, their former spiritual life, the meaning was clear to them, okay? They knew what it was like to be on the outside, but in Christ, they had full rights in God's kingdom. And we also too, we have 
full rights in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what does verse 19 say? It says that they were now members of God's household. And we are too. We are members of God's household. And what a great household to be involved in. You know, I couldn't think of a better, uh, we can't choose our parents or whatever, but God chose us and we chose him and we are members of his household. Now in these verses, the church is compared to a building and it's a reference, listen to this, it's a reference to the holiest place in the temple and that is the holy of holies holy of holies and paul begins verse 20 with a foundation that's provided by the ministry of both the apostles and the prophets the foundation of the building of this building is the message of jesus and it's proclaimed by the apostles and the prophets now the apostles they were separated from the prophets by hundreds of years, okay? But they still shared the same goal. And what was that goal? That goal was proclaiming the word of the Lord. And isn't that our responsibility? Isn't that why we're put on this earth? You know, sometimes we get, I know I do, I get so caught up in me, what's going on in my world. Right now, it's my health. As you can see, I'm struggling, but it's okay. My goal is still to proclaim the word of the Lord. And this reminds us, listen to this, of the importance of Bible preaching and teaching. And that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm teaching you the word of God. And because without it, what's gonna happen? We're gonna be like those who attempt to build their lives um, and govern uh, principles on sand. And when you build on sand, what's gonna happen? Well, there's gonna be a shift in the sand. There's gonna be a mobility of the elements that happen with sand. And what's gonna happen? Eventually you're gonna have a disaster because everything is gonna come tumbling down. Now the apostles, they didn't overlook the prophetic voices or the words of the prophets as they preached Jesus. Aren't you glad for that? They didn't forget about the prophets, what the prophets taught and decide to teach their own thing. No, they taught, they didn't overlook them. As we mentioned in scripture, Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. Jesus gives unity and purpose to the building and the purpose of the church. What are we? We are because we're the church and we're to be the dwelling place of God in the spirit. We're now in Ephesians chapter four, verses 11 to 16. I want you to look at the PowerPoint too, because I got some neat things. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure which slide it is that is written, but we're gonna look at Christ's gifts, uh, how they build the church. In verses 11 to 16, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Now the new American standard Bible says in this verse 12, the for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. In verse 13, I'm going to read that from the King James Version. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. I'm going back now reading from the NIV. Then we will no longer be in Infants, listen to that, infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him. Do you see what that says? From infants to growing up, we'll grow up into him who is the head and who's the head. This is what it says, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in what love, as each part does its work. So each part has to do its work. So we saw that Christ is the head of the church, and he provides special gifts of leadership to the church. 
and the purpose. What is the purpose? It's for bringing it to spiritual maturity. In verse 13, it says, what to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, earlier in this chapter, chapter four, Paul, he, he talked about God's grace as a gift to the church. And you can find that in verse seven. So that says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And so Paul, now he's sharpening his focus to center on special gifts that serve the church. Okay, and these gifts, they promote service among the congregation and also they promote growth toward becoming the full expression of what God intends to church to be because he, um, the, he builds the church as he sees it. Now, Paul identified five leadership gifts in verse 11. Let's look at them. Three of them seem to be focused more on the larger church. It's beyond the local body, okay? And two are more focused on the body itself. So let's look at the apostles and prophets. They were identified earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and said that they are, as we learned, they are the foundation of the church, okay? They were the ones that were especially sent with a charge from the Lord, okay? The Lord told them what to do. And also they were the ones through whom clear and specific and special messages are delivered. Then we got the evangelist. Everybody knows what an evangelist is. They have a, a unique and important ministry. They have to take the gospel to the unbelievers who need to hear the message of the Lord. Then we've got our pastors and our teachers. Aren't you glad for them? I'm glad that for our pastors and their giftings, what do they do? They bless a local congregation. How do they bless them? Well, they instruct believers in what? In the truth of the gospel. So you have to always make sure that you're under a pastor that is bringing forth the truth of the gospel. You need to go back when they're bringing their message. You need to take your little notes or you need to go back and listen to the message. And as they're talking, you need to look it up in scripture and be like the Bereans did in the book of Acts. Go back and, and examine and make sure that what they're saying is the truth. So they, they instruct believers in the truth of the gospel, and they also care for their needs and concerns. Now, isn't that good to know? We do, we know that in this past um last week or whatever that the church got together and they went out and they delivered boxes of food to those that are in need isn't that nice i think that's really good um that the church cares that they're not just there trying to get numbers and get money but they're can they're concerned about the needs of the people whether it be in the local body or outside the body um of of the church and the lord gave the church these leadership gifts why why did the Lord give them leader, these uh, leadership gifts? Well, he wants to promote ministry and service among the believers. Why? Because there's a goal. And what is the goal? It's to build up the body of Christ, which is the church as a whole, as well as the local congregation. Now, unity and knowledge of the Lord that signifies maturity and that leads us toward the full expression of Jesus in us. So we see the contrast is very clear. Instead of being infants, that's in verse 14, where you're easily distracted and deceived, the church is to speak and to live out truth. And what's gonna be the result? You're gonna grow into maturity as each member fulfills his or her call and purpose. And that is what we're to do. It's time for the uh, body of believers to grow up, to stop being infants and to grow up so that we can um, fulfill our call and our purpose for the Lord. 
And the next one, as you can see from the slide, it's about Christ coming. And we know that Jesus is coming very soon. And, and we're going to talk about how the, the believers in, in Christ were going to rise to be with him. Now, a few years ago, the second coming of the Lord was a major topic, okay? It was sermons and conversation, books, oh, books galore about the Lord's coming. And there was much speculation about how these various events were going to unfold. And so, but we can all agree that we have an assurance. And what is that assurance? That there's a glorious future. And we've talked about this before. There's a glorious future that's awaiting the church. And that that future, as Paul taught the Colossian, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Thessalonica church, would be the reality of spending eternity in the presence of the Lord. Now the Thessalonians, they accepted this message because they recognized that it was the truth. It was the absolute truth, okay? Let's see, they had a, a question that was concerning them. And that question was, well, what about the believers who died before the Lord returned uh, to receive the believers into his eternal presence? They, they were very concerned about that, okay? So to better understand their question, it's how, how Helpful to understand the ancient culture of the Roman Empire back then. See, many people, they rejected the idea of a bodily resurrection. And this belief, it impacted the church and it even reached into the Christian understanding of the Lord. But if this was the case, then some were concerned that their brothers and sisters who had passed on, they wouldn't be included in this glorious future. So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 13 to 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, hallelujah, he's going to come down. King James Version said he's going to shall descend from heaven. Well, with a loud, and we went, we went through this, um, I believe, um, in last uh, uh, unit, the last unit. It's going to come down with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with a trumpet call of God, and the dead of Christ are going to rise first. And after that, we are still alive, and our left will be caught up together. Look at that, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other. King James Version says, comfort one another with these words and I don't know if I said this before in one of my other lessons but I don't know about you but I always wanted to ride on a cloud I thought that would be really neat just laying on a cloud and so we're going to caught up like it says and um, we're going to arise uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord so in these verses, Paul, he answers their concern with a word of assurance. He's reminding them of what Jesus did, how Jesus died on the cross and how he rose from the dead. And because he rose, like we already know, gee, um, death is in an end for the believer. There's a great future for all Christians those living and those that are dead and in verse 16 it says for the lord himself so it's not going to be a patriarch it's not going to be a prophet it's not going to be an angel but it's going to be jesus our savior himself verse 16 king james says shall descend now in Acts chapter 1, and you might remember this, in Acts chapter 1, verses uh, 10 to 11, there's these two angels, and they're standing near as the disciples, they watch Jesus as he goes up, okay? And, and as they're watching them go into heaven, they declared this, and I'm going to quote, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will 
come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So that's in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. So we can see from that verse that Jesus himself is going to return for us. And he's going to descend with a personal shout. The voice of the archangel will resonate. And the trumpet of God is going to ring out. So there's no reason to doubt that these accompanying to his return will be literal. Now the Israelites, they heard the sound of a trumpet, a loud trumpet coming from Mount Sinai and they trembled, okay? And that's in Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Also, these audible manifestations are gonna announce his appearance, but listen to what Hebrews, chapter 9 verse 28 says he, he it's gonna um these audible manifestation will announce his appearance unto them that look for him so we need to always be ready and waiting looking for the return of our lord jesus christ and what's going to follow these sounds of his coming it's going to be like not like unlike anything that has ever happened before and those that are asleep in christ they're gonna rise from their graves and they're gonna join the living saints and together will ascend to heaven now in latin the phrase caught up that's in verse 17 uh, is a translation of the word raptus i'm gonna spell that for you just in case i didn't say it right it's R-A-P-T-U-S. It's from which the concept of rapture uh, comes. Because a lot of people say that the word rapture isn't in the Bible. So you could say, well, yes, it is. In verse 17, there's a word that says caught up and it comes from the Latin word R-A-P-T-U-S. And that means rapture. So not only will those who die before the, the return of Christ um, not be abandoned, but they're actually gonna rise first. And then finally, Paul wrote that we should, in verse 18, we should encourage. The King James Version says comfort. We should encourage or we should comfort each other with the words that Paul had just written. We're to cast away our sorrow because the dead in Christ, they're not lost. They're not forgotten. They're more alive than ever before. And they will share in this great occasion of our Lord's coming with those who remain. So um, uh, these are very comforting words. They're very encouraging words for the believer. I think I made a mistake there, but anyway. Okay, now some people, they may have been frightened by some of the events that um, were described in books and movies portraying the second coming of the Lord. These warnings though, they have to be heeded, okay? You have to take them seriously, all right? Uh, and some of the events, they're, they're sobering, they're uh, severe, and they can be discouraging. But we can have, we as Christians, we can have hope. Why? Well, because ultimately, hallelujah, Satan, he is going to be defeated. And we're going to go and we're going to live with Jesus, and he's the victor. So we're going to live with him forever in eternal joy. And now I'm reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And it says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy. Report a letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lowliness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. 
where the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds him back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displaying, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracle signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing they perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved that's so sad why don't they get with it why can't they understand but they refuse to love to love the truth and be saved for this reason god sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned King James Version says, be damned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. King James Version says, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Excuse me. And they, and we all know that sin is a pleasurable for a season. And then after that, it results in death. So in Paul, and, that, and that's my version, in Paul's second letter, because this is a second letter to the Thessalonians, he, he is addressing, there's this false teaching again it's troubling the believers there and again they're wondering whether the day of the lord the rapture and the events uh following did it already come and this teaching they're they they believe they're saying that paul taught this so that's wrong he wasn't he didn't do that and so he replies that there were two events that were going to precede the day of the lord and you know it's funny because i was listening to a christian program today and they talked about this so there's going to be two events that are going to precede the day of the lord there's going to be a rebellion and then there's going to be the revelation of whom of, of one whom he called the man of lawlessness the antichrist and of course in this program that i watched today they started naming who they thought was going to be uh, the false prophet and who there's these people that are lined up that they think could be the antichrist but i'm not going to go there because i don't know if it's true so but anyway the rebellion which is an apostasy it refers to a deliberate turning away from the gospel and that in itself is very sad how could you after you've learned about the gospel how and i know you get discouraged you know you the things of the world seem to entice you and draw you to earn so you forget about the 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 lord but this rebellion it's an apostasy it's going to be you're going to deliberately turn away from the gospel and then this man of lawlessness he's going to be identified by the ungodly activities that are listed in what I just read. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse four, and I'm just gonna highlight them quickly. There's gonna be opposition to the will of God, okay? There's gonna be a determination is they're gonna be greater than God. Who could be greater than God? He's the great I am, okay? We know that, but they don't know that. So they, he's gonna be seen as greater than God and pridefully claim he's gonna claim to be God, okay? And then there's gonna be a deliberate choice to violate God's temple and I had taught about that I don't know if you remember last the last unit or in one of the lessons we talked about that and he's going to use extraordinary powers and signs and wonders and where are they going to come from they're not going to come from God because they're counterfeit so they're going to come from Satan okay but he, we already know his doom is certain what's going to happen is God is going to overthrow him so Paul well, he already did overthrow him, okay, but Paul assured the Thessalonians that his, teach, his teaching, what he had taught them, was simply affirming what he taught them while he was present with them, when he was among them. And there's a factor we see that is presently holding back the rebellion and the man of lawlessness. And Pastor Lanier said that on Sunday. It's the Holy Spirit working in and through the church. Now the return of the church, or the, re I didn't mean return, the removal of the church, it hasn't occurred yet. But when it does, it's gonna open the way for the day of the Lord, and it's gonna be a time of terrible judgment. And in the process, look at verse 10, what's gonna happen? We, many are gonna be deceived 
Why? Because they refuse to receive what verse 10 says, the love of the truth. They're stubborn, prideful, arrogant, boastful. They don't want, they don't want to get it. Okay. They're being deceived. And to those who reject it, the truth, God is going to send a blindness that is going to cause them to accept it. Now, when I say blindness, I don't mean blindness in, in your natural eyes, but it's going to be spiritual blindness, okay? That's going to cause them to accept as truth the words of Antichrist. And what's going to happen? People are going to call, which we're living in right now. People are going to call evil good and good evil. And they're going to put darkness for light and light for darkness. And you can find that in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Again, what is in the old is being revealed in the new uh, testament, that is. So what's happening? There's scriptural error. And that's going to contribute to the darkening the human soul is being darkening so it ultimately takes pleasures in concepts and behaviors that god hates god doesn't like it but they are going to uh, can be deceived and now it's interesting that people and you may have noticed this people who re reject the bible they're quick to accept anything. Imagine that. They're quick to accept anything other than the Bible. That's why people like this, they frequently find Christ-denying religions. They find them appealing. They want things that, that, are, that satisfy the flesh, what their itching ears want to hear. And because in verses 11 and 12, because they reject the truth of the Lord and they find, the scripture says, pleasure in unrighteousness. God blinds their minds so that they are going to believe a lie. And as the King James Version says, they're going to be damned. Now, I just want to explain to you that the assembly of God, which we are, we're, we're of the assembly of God, we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That means that we will not be here when all this bad stuff happens. Aren't you glad for that? Say hallelujah and thank you for Jesus. He is going to rescue us from that. Oh, did you just see that? That the um this uh right here this slide the mount of olives that's the site of jesus's return at the second coming and that's photographed from the walls of old jerusalem looking across the kidron valley valley isn't that neat i've never been to israel maybe someday i'll get to go there i don't know okay now we're on a new slide okay in this new slide, we're going to talk about, as this says, pastoral care and instruction. Now, this second segment of the lesson moves to what is known as the pastoral epistles, okay? And what are they? They're First and Second Timothy and Titus. And as we've been going through these books, they've been given the books of the Bible. There's been different um, meanings of what those books are. And so these are called the pastoral epistles. And Paul, he was a mentor to Timothy and to Titus. Both of them, they traveled uh, with him at some point. And Paul shared some rich truths um, and uh, and they um, apply to the lives of believers. They apply to us today as well as they were back then. And But these beliefs, they're just because it has to do with leadership, it's not limited to just individual in leadership positions, okay? So Paul wrote letters to two of his protégés, and as you probably picked up who they are, they're Timothy and Titus. And these were men they worked with uh, Paul in preaching the gospel, and now they were leading congregations in Ephesus and in Crete. And Paul used first, um, uh, 
Paul used 1 Timothy chapter 5 to set out some important teachings that Timothy was to reinforce with the believers. And what were those teachings? They were relationship within families and with the um, church and such is responsibility to care for, hello, Doris, me and you to care for the widows, okay? So if you want to learn, anybody wants to learn about the responsibility for the widows, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And also proper respect for the elders and proper care for your health, their health. Now we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at verses 3 to 10. If anyone listen to this, if anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies, controversies and quarrel about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great grain. Well, we brought nothing into this world and we could take nothing out of it. So don't think of thinking when you're going to die to tell all, to tell your members of the family behind that are leaving behind you, hey, look, when I die, put in my casket, my whatever, my diamond, my necklace, my stereo stuff, whatever. You can't put that in there, okay? You can't take anything with you, okay? You brought nothing in and you can't take nothing out. But in verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, hallelujah, which we do, will we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful, harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Well, look at this, because a lot of people, they quote this verse wrong. It's for the love of money. It's the love of money, not money, but it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. So now Paul, he's warning that there were going to be some of those. They weren't going to accept his positive uh, teachings about life of the community, okay? And so he saw these people as they're conceited, they lacked understanding, and they're quarreling and they're um, disputing um, different issues. And their oppos opposition to sound uh, teaching was at least partly rooted in the assumption they're thinking that the goal of the Christian faith is financial gain. And you've heard that before. You've heard, heard people say that, oh, all those Christians want, that's all they're ever asking for is for money, okay? But what does really bring gain? Look at the scriptures. It's not necessarily financial gain, but it's the contentment that grows out of godliness. See, the true believer, they recognize that the search for financial gain, it's a never-ending cycle. Why? Because no matter how much money you get, you're going to always want more. You're going to want a bigger car, a bigger house, more clothes, this and that, okay? So believers, what do we have to see? Contentment, not in uh, money or material wealth, but we're in godliness of character through Jesus. For what does verse 6 say? Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we should recognize that having the basic needs for exist, uh, existence, uh, like food, clothing, shelter, uh, supplies, that is adequate. And the love of money and the overemphasis on getting rich, they have the potential to produce other evils. So it's no surprise. There's always going to be some who refuse to follow sound teaching and living. And Paul noted that a refusal of that, it's a sign of the last days. And you can find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Um, it says, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine and said to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We're in Second Timothy now. We're in chapter 3. But mark this. 
I'm going to read from one to seven. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. I think we're in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful and proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. King James says, from such turn away. They, going back to NIV, they are the kind who win their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul incurred um, yeah, that was in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, Paul encouraged Timothy in the Lord, and he challenged him to be a good soldier of Jesus. And here now in chapter 3, he's, he's sharpening Timothy's discernment. He's warning him of the danger to come. And in these verses, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, these verses, Paul is providing a detailed list of character traits and action of those who fall away from the truth. And there's a, a sad, he ends with a sad commentary. And that is that they love pleasure more than they love God. And that is sad. We can't afford to put anything above God, no matter how much he blessed us. We can't love our material possessions more than we love God. We can't love our husbands or our animals or anything else. God always has to be first. So they love pleasure more than they love God. And they maintain a form of their faith, but they deny the true power of the gospel. And now we often use this portion of, of scripture to highlight the characteristics of the last day generation. But Paul, he didn't strictly refer to this error. He spoke instead of conditions that Timothy, he was gonna encounter in his time, say in which it applies to today's time too, that in verse five, he says, from such turn away. But like the prophecy of Jesus concerning wars, pestilence, and natural disasters in the last days, and you can read, I think that's in Matthew, uh, these elements, they're only going to intensify as we near the coming of the Lord. So in other words, all those, these attributes, they describe every generation. They especially defined the mindset that will prevail during the last days of the dispensation of grace. Because you know that's what we are in right now. We are in the dispensation of grace. God has given us a time right now of grace where he's trying to call everybody to come to him. But that, that window of grace, it's coming closer and closer where that window is gonna be closed. And there's no longer gonna be his grace extended upon the earth. That's why we need to stay focused and fixed on the Lord and not walk away from him. Time is too short. We've got to get our lives right with him. We've got to get serious with him. We can't fool around. This is not a game. This is not a game. We're in a war. As the scripture says, and you all know this because I tell you it all the time against the principalities and the powers and the darkness and the forces of the, the um, spiritual the darkness and the forces of the evil world. We are now young Christians, whether or not they are in leadership roles, they need spiritual mentors that are gonna challenge them and guide them, okay? Because we know right now the millennials, 
they don't know anything about what's going on. So they need someone to challenge them and guide them. And Paul served in this role to the younger Timothy and Titus as they led their congregations. And Timothy and Titus, they had great responsibilities in their ministries. I'm reading from 2 Timothy. We are now in 2 Timothy chapter 2 because we were just in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. So turn back and go to chapter 2 and we're in, um, in verses 1 to 7. And by, I'm only going to read 1 and 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witness and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul is challenging Timothy. He says, be strong in the grace that comes through Jesus. And there's a good reason for this, okay? Why? What does grace do? It provides invaluable help when someone is facing the challenges of opposition and rejection. The grace of Jesus, it's the inward, okay? Inward power, which enables us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And that's found in Ephesians chapter six, verse 10. Now Paul called on Timothy to take what he had learned from him. He's saying, Timothy, I want you to take what you've learned from me. I want you to pass these doctrines along to other faithful men. I want you to teach it to them. You see, it's vital that leaders not only live by the truths that have been taught to them, but that they also have to pass these truths on to others. Why? Because then the other people, they could take that truth, that doctrine, and they can teach it to others. So it'd be like a snowball. It's just gonna keep on rolling, okay? The church, it endures and grows as its truths are passed on to succeeding generations. We can't allow the next generation not to uh, gleam or learn, I should say. They, they need to learn what we learned so that they can keep the ball rolling. They can keep it going for generations and generations until finally this world is rolled up like, a, a, I think he says, a garment. And then the world, it comes to an end. In verse 3, um, we're still in Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. Endure hardship. Listen to that. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. A hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord. We'll give you insight into all of um, into all of this. So here Paul is using he's using three images to impress upon Timothy some important issues of or lessons of leadership. He talks about the soldier, he talks about the athlete, and he talks about the farmer. And so th through these images, Paul is offering a, a reminder that leadership role that includes suffering, okay? It was true for Paul, and it's gonna be true for all leaders. And that's in verse three, where I stress the word, uh, where it said, endure hardship, okay? So hard times are gonna come. There may be some suffering. And the image of the soldier, because he talked about a soldier, it challenges the leader. What did he say? You have to have a single focus, okay? And it, you, what you want to do is you want to please the one who enrolled you in your service. And scripture says to please his commanding officer. Well, who's our commanding officer? As Christians, for the Christian leader, our officer is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we have to do. It challenges us. Our focus must be on him. That's the Lord. And then we have to receive, how are we going to get a crown? If you're gonna, if you, when you get your crown, what the scripture said, it's indicative of winning an athletic contest. But what do you have to do? You have to follow the rules of the game. So what do we have to do? We ha we're all going to receive a crown. And what do we have to do to receive that crown? We have to um, obey the rules that are in the Bible. And then the farmer. It says he's hardworking, okay? And he's diligent. And he's about his task. And what's, when his task is all over, what's gonna happen? He's gonna enjoy the fruit of his labor. And that's just like us too. When our task is over, 
we're going to enjoy the fruit of everlasting life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm in Titus and I'm in um, chapter three and I'm going to read all the way down to verse eight. And I'm reading this whole thing out of the King James version. Okay. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by how the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made ears according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I desire that you affirm constantly that those who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men so in these verses verses one to four paul he's outlining for titus titus he was the first pastor of the island of crete a threefold christian duty and that's also mandatory uh, for us too what's the first one that the christian must wisely support Court, civil government and that's found in verse one when it says principalities powers and magistrates second in a spirit of humility we, we must be self-sacrificing in relation to society in general and that is in verse two when it says speak evil of no man that's a hard one because sometimes when our righteous indignation gets up we like to say something bad about somebody that hurt us and we're not supposed to. And third, and again, I've done it. So don't think, oh, my word, you know, don't don't go there. Just be like I always say, be quick to confess. And to, the third thing we have to do is we have to be conscious of our personal moral well-being. And that's in verse three. It says we're not to be foolish and self-serving. So what is Paul basically emphasizing? He's saying that the duty of believers in relation to other people is to respect authority, respect each other, and respect ourselves. And I know in today, there's not a heck of a whole lot of respect for other people going around. So we just have to pray for them. And we still have to try to respect others, even if we don't agree with their views. As important as good works are, they don't make a person good. It's in verse five that it says, it's not by works of righteousness that we find salvation. And that, that new life, it has to come from within. And how could that happen? It could only happen by God's mercy. And in verse 5, it says, by the washing of regeneration. But the heart, it has to be more than just cleansed. It has to be filled. The removal of the stain of sin is only the beginning. And there has to be, in verse 5, the renewing of the Holy Spirit so that the inward sanctification of a believer of a believer experiences changes inward sanctification experiences changes to the outward what's in is going to come out to the outward progression um progressive sanctification so what is god saying to us in all of this there, there's three important truths from this lesson and the first one is that if we grasp, if we get hold of the fact that Jesus is the head of the church, we're going to recall and remember that he's worthy of our obedience and our service. And that to Jesus, he's going to return soon, very soon. And that should motivate us to look forward to his coming. We have hope, even though there's a lot of bad, there's a lot of negative, there's a lot of discouragement, there's a lot of chaos and violence in the world. Jesus is coming soon so we can still have hope and we can have joy in the midst of us, in the midst of it. And three, God has given leadership gifts. Why? To help Christians 
for service. And so with this in mind, we need to seek out people that are going to help us in our walk with the Lord or uh, and to help us grow in our faith. And likewise, we need to look for opportunities where we can help others grow in their faith and help them in their walk with the Lord. Can you say amen? Amen. amen.